Humans around the world and across time go through rites of passage. Some events are once in a lifetime, like a baptism or a bar mitzvah. Other rites of passage reoccur, like starting a new job, moving to a new home, or having a child. But in either case, these events are set aside as the chapter points in our lives, times when we know that our story going forward will be different. In many Native American cultures, especially those around the Great Plains, the most important rite of passage is known as a vision quest, which is made by a seeker in hope of receiving a spiritual vision or message. Now, traditions vary across Native American cultures. Uh, for some, the quest might involve time removed from society, looking for guidance from the natural world. Other vision quests might include fasting, dancing, or even psychedelics to help open the seeker to the spirit world. Now, every vision quest is different, as every culture is different, and every person is different. But all the stories about them speak to a deeply personal journey. By listening to each seeker's stories, we can better appreciate living Native American traditions, as well as understand our own journeys through life. My name is Sean. Welcome to Mythos and Logos. While no two traditions of what is in English called a vision quest are exactly the same, we can gain a broad understanding of the rites of passage by what is shared between them. Much can be learned in this way from looking at indigenous languages. The Ojibwe name for the quest means fasting. The Lakota name for the quest means to cry for a vision. And the root for the Pawnee words, meaning vision or dream, means to learn by being touched. These three names for three different ideas shared by these rituals point to something that they all share. The goal of a life-changing experience by the method of fasting and prayer. Some rituals, like the sunrise dance of the Apache in the southwest, are experienced by many together. For others, a group may help prepare or guide one in a rite of passage, but the quest is taken up alone. One such group is the Lakota, from which the medicine man Lame Deer tells the story of one family preparing their son for his retreat into the high mountain wilderness. They put up a sweat lodge to purify him with the hot, white breath of sacred steam. They sanctified him with the incense of sweet grass, rubbing his body with sage, fanning it with an eagle's wing. Then they went to the hilltop with him to prepare the vision and make an offering of tobacco bundles. Then they told the young man to cry for a sign from the Great Spirit, for a gift which would make him into a medicine man. The young man in this story is confident, and when he is alone that night, he shouts, challenging the spirits to come up with a vision fit for a soon-to-be great medicine man. The spirits answer him, yelling back that the young man is annoying them and needs to either be quiet or go home. The young seeker takes this as a challenge, vowing to yell all night until he sees the spirits with his own eyes. And he does, but they come as a massive boulder and send him running, sprinting down the mountain for the safety of his home. And when he finally reaches flat land, the young man is ashamed, 
telling his uncle that it was all for nothing. But the elder responds, Well, you did learn one thing. You went after a vision like a hunter. You were fighting the spirits. You thought they owed you a vision. Suffering alone brings no vision, nor does courage, nor does sheer willpower. A vision comes as a gift born of humility, of wisdom, and of patience. If from your vision quest you have learned nothing but this, you have already learned much. Going through the motions of the ritual, as we can see, is not enough. The young man in the story had been ritually prepared, but is mentally unprepared to meet the spirits. But ready or not, in the traditional Lakota understanding, spirits exist all around us. Rituals are important, but only insofar as they help us to prepare ourselves to meet what is already there. In another story, from another part of the continent, we will see that for someone who is prepared, the spirits can bring life-changing gifts. The Ojibwe, native to the Great Lakes of the northern United States and Canada, tell of an ancient time when in the cold of winter, survival would depend on a successful hunt. Legends tell of an Ojibwe man who constantly thanks the Great Spirit, Kichie Manitou, for giving his family just enough to get by. And when his son, Wunsh, reaches adulthood, he retreats into nature, as is tradition, to seek his vision. On the first day, Wunsh wanders the forest and contemplates the nature within it. On the second day, he wonders how the plants of the woods can live and grow without the struggle that is all his family has ever known. And as he goes to sleep that night, he wishes that the Great Spirit will give a way to help his people. After three days of fasting, Wunsch is too weak to leave his bed. When outside, he sees a beautiful figure descending gracefully from the sky. The figure wears feathers on his head and many layers of fine green and yellow clothes. If there is any doubt that this is his vision, it vanishes when the figure speaks to him. I am sent to you, my friend, by that great spirit who made all things in the sky and on the earth. He has seen and knows your motives in fasting, that it is from a kind and benevolent wish to do good to your people, that you do not seek for strength in war or praise of warriors. I am sent to instruct you and show you how you can do your kindred good. The spirit tells Wunsch to get up and wrestle with him, and though Wunsch is weak, he is brave and he would rather die than fail at his quest. He wrestles with the beautiful spirit until he's about to collapse from exhaustion, when the beautiful stranger stops to leave. But the quest is not over here, as the spirit leaves Wunsch, saying to him, Good work, kid. See you tomorrow. The next day, the spirit arrives again, and though the young man's body is weaker, his courage is stronger. Again, Wunsch wrestles with the beautiful spirit, and again, the spirit stops just before he collapses. And again, good work, kid. See you tomorrow. The next day, the spirit indeed appears to Wunsch again, and after six days without food, 
his body is weaker than ever, but his willpower has never been so strong, and he is determined to either prevail or perish. As he wrestles with the spirit for the third time, Wunsch nears a total collapse, until something new happens. The spirit taps out. For the first time, then, the spirit enters the lodge and speaks to Wunsch. He tells that the next day, the final day of his week-long fast, he will come again. The spirit tells Wunsch that they will wrestle again, and again, he will win. Then after his victory, Wunsch must clear a place in the earth, remove the spirit's fine garments, and bury his body, taking care to visit the spot from time to time to clear any weeds from the plot for the day that the spirit will come back to life. The stranger tells Wunsch that by following his instructions, he will do a great good to his people, and leaves not with his usual words, but by shaking his hand. When the week of fasting ends, Wunsch's father brings him food, saying that the great spirit does not want him to starve. Wunsch thanks his father, but says that he has one last thing to do first. The beautiful spirit arrives right on time, and seeing him gives Wunsch more strength than ever, even before his fast. They wrestle one last time, and Wunsch wins, following the spirit's instructions to strip and bury him, confident that his friend will return to life. Only then does Wunsch return to his father's lodge, taking a small bit of the food prepared for him. For the next months, Wunsch quietly returns to the plot of earth set aside and tends to the spirit's grave. Soon, he sees small green plumes rising from the ground. Wunsch never forgets the place, and for months he secretly goes to tend the plot of earth, with it growing faster the better he keeps it. When summer draws to a close, and the hunt becomes scarce, Wunsch brings his father to the place, where they see tall stalks of corn moving gracefully in the wind, wrapped in leaves as elegant as the spirit's heavenly clothes. Wunsch tells his father that the days of depending on the hunt and the waters for their food are over. For if this gift is cherished, the land itself will provide. They bring the corn home where Wunsch tells his story to the people who give thanks to Kichia Manitou, the great spirit who heard his cries, and Mondaomin, the spirit of the corn who touched Wunsch with the gift of his own life. The vision quest tradition is so lasting and widespread because it presents a pattern which occurs all across our lives. In order for something new to be discovered, there must be a retreat from the life we know. For people, that can mean stepping away from the noise and pressures of modern life to reconnect with who we are. On a social level, stepping out of the boxes set by our families, companies, nations, or cultures can help us to see what those groups are missing. And even on the deepest internal level, it is by turning from our comfortable and learn habits that we can evaluate what we need to change. The Lakota story tells us that we must do this with a humble openness to learn, and the Ojibwe story shows us what comes next. Discovering what we must change is still only a first step. The young Ojibwe man didn't just watch plants grow in the nature and then return home. 
As the Pawnee word for vision means to learn by being touched, we must interact with what we find we need. This isn't easy. Wunsch wrestled with the spirit he met until he was about to collapse, and this isn't a one-time effort either. After each fight, the spirit tells him that he will return. But in time, we master the challenge before us and discover the meaning at its heart, just as Wunsch wins his match with the spirit and removes the bright garments to get to its core. But even once we have found, wrestled with, and been touched by the spirit, our quest is not finished. Lest we forget, Wunsch cared for the place where he buried the corn. We too must remember, care, and tend to what we learn, so that we may come to harvest the fruits.